morning. Thank you, choir, and thank you, Tom. Appreciate your word. As we come to the month of November, we typically use this time in our church to uh, talk about commitment as we lead up to Thanksgiving, as we lead up to Advent. We often spend this time talking about what it means to commit our lives, our abilities, our talents, our time, our resources, our experiences, everything that we are and everything that we have to God. It's a bit overwhelming, right? We talk about everything that we want to give to God. Is this what God really wants in yes, our whole lives? Are we maybe being a bit fanatic or, or over the top with language like this? Well, I want to at least start off this morning with a prayerful and honest assessment of where we, write, where we are right now in our commitment to God. Think about your priorities. Spend a few moments this morning sort of evaluating where are you with your goals and your hopes and dreams that you have for yourself and for our church. Maybe you can begin to truthfully answer some of these questions. What does my commitment to God look like right now? And if you were to be completely honest and evaluate it, how big is the gap between where it is and where I want it to be? What should I be trading my time here on earth for? Many of you have great perspective on that. What should I be uh, looking for? for my family and myself, if we really want to commit ourselves to God in new and deeper ways? What might I be willing to sacrifice in order to make sure that others have the opportunity to have life transformation in Jesus? What am I going to do with this resurrection life that God has offered me? Uh, what do I do with all my stuff? Does God have anything to say about that? How can I connect my life with the lives of others in a more uh, authentic way? an impactful way. And what about my worship on Sunday morning? How does that translate into my hands and my feet and my actions and my words the rest of the week? And so where do I start with all this? How do we get where we want to be? So maybe this morning as you're kind of thinking about commitment, uh, you're thinking about these questions and you're thinking about them honestly. And as, as I begin to ask myself some of these questions, I, oddly enough, I can't help but think of some of the conversations that I have with some of my, some of my best friends. Uh, we're sort of sports nerds, in a way, I guess you might say, and we keep on talk, love to talk about scenarios. Uh, and if you're not into sports, please just bear with me for just a few moments. But we come up with these scenarios, like for example, would you be willing to trade three really bad seasons of UK basketball for one championship season? You know, maybe weigh it out. You know, three years of missing the tournament to one year of winning it all. I don't know, you know, because we have a reputation to pull. You know, or, or let's think of it this way. As the football team continues to struggle, which is sad, new year, same results, would we trade, if you're a fan of UK bas football, would you be willing to trade just one championship of the SEC for maybe even the basketball, men's and women's teams, both winning a national championship? You know, maybe these scenarios, we love to talk about the possibilities. And, and, and these sometimes come into play with my fandom of, uh, the, the Cleveland Browns winning a Super Bowl or the uh, uh, Cubs winning a World Series. As you might be able to tell, there's a lot of sports heartache in my life, uh, if you know anything about these teams. But most of these scenarios take the form of, if I actually had the power to control it, what would I choose? What is some sort of victory really worth? Having all the information and options laid out in front of me, what would I pick? Well, it's here that we turn to our story in the Gospel of Mark about Jesus and a man often referred to as the rich young ruler. And if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 10. And we'll read verses 17 through 22. And it says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? And Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, and honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. 
Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. In this story, Jesus starts off revealing the young man's uh, propensity to confuse rule keeping with salvation. That's a good place to start, but he moves real quickly to the heart of the issue. And Jesus says, essentially, you can have life your way, or you can have life my way. He lays it out as an option for him. In church, we often talk about salvation as inviting Jesus into our hearts and making him our Lord and our Savior. How many of you heard that? Make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Yes, a few of you have heard that, I'm assuming. You've been in church for a few years. Uh, and, and it's helpful language, I think, but sometimes I wonder, when we're talking about this life transformation in Jesus that, that Tom talked about, it, it's being helpful in just experiencing the, the love transforms us. I wonder if sometimes if people really understand what it is that Jesus is asking of them when we say that. You know, salvation, it's not so, not so bad. It's pretty straightforward when you understand your sin. That the death and resurrection of Jesus is the way for us to find God's forgiveness. It makes sense to ask Jesus to be my Savior. We can even draw parallels with language that we're familiar with. Like they say someone is drowning and someone saves them, we call them a Savior. Most of us are pretty quick to say, yeah, I'd like a savior. That sounds pretty good. I understand my sin. I understand what it means uh, to to be saved from my sin. But how about Lord? I mean, people don't use that language a whole lot these days. There's there's not a lot of really good language out there uh, that explains, like in this story, that we're to give Jesus control over our lives, that he can tell us what to do and what not to do. There's not, even, there's not a lot of positive words, at least. Sometimes, you know, they might use words like slave and master. There's not a whole lot of us who would sign up to be willingly so slave. In fact, as good Americans, it's sort of built into our DNA to resist an overlord, to resist control outside of our own personal self-determined will. And yet, this is what Jesus is asking for. To surrender ourselves, lay down our life, die to the flesh. He wants us to make him our Lord. A word we've been focusing on is our 2015 theme. It's the word allegiance. Allegiance, you all know that word. And it's, it, it, I think it can be really helpful here. Most of often this word is associated with nationalism, but it's the essence of what is meant by the simple declaration in the Bible that Jesus is Lord. In the first century, good citizens of Rome would declare themselves, would declare Caesar is Lord. That was what you would say. You would, you would line up before the officials and you would declare your allegiance by saying Caesar is Lord. However, Christians saw themselves as citizens of a new kingdom, a different kind of empire. And, and it was considered treasonous when they would swear allegiance to Jesus instead of Caesar. Like what we hear in the the book of Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before the fiery furnace, these first Christians took their loyalty to Jesus very seriously. He was Lord alone. There was no room for Caesar to be Lord as well. And and so if you were to ask him the question, what, what belongs to God? If he is Lord and we give him our allegiance, and the answer has to be everything. Everything belongs to God. So, going back to the rich young ruler, I want you to notice that there are two distinct parts to what Jesus asks of this young man. Uh, First, he says, give up your wealth. And then he says, and follow me. And, And I think, I really believe that Jesus here is ultimately most interested in the second part, you know, the following part. But what Jesus knows is that in order for this guy to follow, he would have to make room in his life for him. His life is so full. Wealth, reputation, influence, outward appearance, some really good things. 
But there's no room left for the very best thing, following Jesus. Just practically speaking, you can imagine, how could this guy travel the countryside with Jesus, listen to his teaching, focus on what he's supposed to be focusing on, and, and, and have to worry about finding places for his mules and his servants and his wardrobe? I mean, practically speaking, Jesus didn't have time to be slowed down by this man's accumulation of wealth. It did not serve the kingdom's purpose. Jesus wanted to free him up from the first part so that he could actually follow through on the second part. Sell all your stuff so that you may be able to follow me. Do you hear the difference? Do you ever think about your commitment then in terms of what God may be asking you to give up? It's not necessarily that this morning you hear um, God speaking to your heart saying, okay, I want you to add A, B, C, D, all these things. But maybe instead what you're first hearing is God saying, oh, your life is too full for the best things. You need to quit some things. Maybe God wants to grow you through letting go. Getting rid of some of your self-imposed boundaries. It reminds me of the principle of the goldfish. You know, when I was a kid... We had goldfish. You know, you'd go to the fair, have a little bag with a little, little fish. Lasted a couple weeks tops, you know. However, my parents uh, a few years ago moved to a new home, and they have an outdoor fish pond. And they have goldfish. However, you wouldn't know it because these are huge fish, and they've been around for years. And I'm like, what? How are these? Well, the principle is here is that what you may not know is that a goldfish grows to the size of its bowl. If it's in a little tiny bowl, that's how big a goldfish gets. And so this rich young man had a small perspective on life based on the temporary wealth and accomplishments he had achieved, things that he could see and things he could touch and, and hold on to. He could only go so far with God so long as that was the bowl that he was swimming in. Yeah, I keep the commandments, he said. That's small fishbowl living. If that's all you think about is rule keeping. But Jesus wanted to expand the size of his bowl through letting go of all that. What do we need to lay down so that we don't remain hemmed in to a small faith? You know, darkness won't need to destroy us if it can only distract us into small faith. If it can keep us hemmed in. I've heard it said that the battle for our hearts is fought on the pages of our calendars. That's a good place to start quitting some things, right? giving some things up. Don't just fill your life with more stuff. There are some very good things that Jesus wants you to get rid of, to sell, to to hand off to someone else. Let God free you up so that you can actually follow him. One of Bob Goff's quotes from his book, Love Does, and it's really stuck with me for a long time, is is this simple statement. I used to be afraid of failing at something that really mattered to me, but now I'm more afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. That's the kind of fishbowl living that I'm I'm worried that that I might end up doing if I don't let go of some things. Ultimately here, though, this becomes a story of someone being offered a trade. He weighs the value. He's deciding what he's giving up versus what he's gaining, right? He's He's weighing the options. He's asking, is this worth the trade? Is it a good deal? He's a good businessman, as evidenced by his accumulation of wealth. And he asks the question that business people ask, right? Is it worth it? And what's he choose? What would we choose in a situation like that? Maybe we look at this rich young man, and we think, oh, Man, I cannot believe that he traded something temporary for something eternal. Or, oh, this is a classic case of, of Esau's birthright being sold for a bowl of soup. How could, you make, how could you not make this trade? Because as we know in the story, the rich man walks away because it says he had great wealth. But Jesus states it another way. Uh, if you turn over and look at, at two short parables, a couple brief stories that Jesus tells in Matthew 13... And it's just three verses, Matthew 13, 44, 45, and 46. And it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, 
When a man found it, he hid it again, then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Just like with the rich young ruler, these are, are stories about someone choosing what something is worth. In both of them, a person exchanges everything he owns for a massive treasure. It's a pretty good deal, right? You know, me personally, I have a house, a couple cars, whatever. But I'd be happy to trade all that for millions of dollars. I mean, that's what this story is saying. It's an easy choice. It's pretty straightforward. Of course, you can imagine that the people watching the, these folks sell off all their possessions think they're pretty foolish because they don't know what these men know. They don't know the true value of, of what they're about to gain. And his actions only make sense in light of what he stands to gain. So hard sacrifice? Really? Not when you know the true value, the real worth of what awaits you. So the heart of the issue this morning, I think, comes back down to us. Jesus says we have the same opportunity. We can get the riches of eternity with God starting today. That is the good news. That is the gospel. That we can receive the power and victory of the resurrected Jesus right now. New life for old. That is a trade that Jesus is offering us today. However, we have to lay down our lives. We have to say no to ourselves and yes to God. Value-wise, it's an easy choice. Yes, of course, I would prefer heaven over hell. Yes, I would love, I, would, I want love instead of hate and revenge. Yes, please, peace in my soul instead of fear and anxiety. But will I pull the trigger and say yes? Will I actually allow him to come into my life and have control? Will I make him the most important thing in my life? Will I invite Jesus to be my Lord and Savior? The rich young ruler realizes in this moment that he is being asked to turn his back on everything he has ever known, his entire life up to this point, that got him his wealth and his respect. It would mean considering everything else that he'd worked for and given his life to as meaningless. That's, that's hard. But when faced with the same decision here, Paul also has to deal with this. And this is what he says writing in the book of Philippians. Philippians 4, or 3, I'm sorry, 7 uh, through 11. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul is saying here that everything else is worthless. It's worth it. I choose faith in Christ because that is worth the trade. And it is worth it. Nothing you ever exchange for a relationship with God will you ever regret. Again, the words of Jesus, what would it benefit for a man if he were to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Those words ring here. At the end of life, you will not stand before the creator of heaven and earth before him and wish that you had been more selfish. You will not stand there and wish that you, that you had held tighter to your possessions and to your heart, that you had been less generous and less humble in this life. And one of the things that I love about, about Pastor Allen's leadership is how he is always challenging us to think about the next right step. For you right now, what is God wanting you to do next? We don't go from A to Z, Instead, we go click by click by click 
A and then B and then C in our Christian growth. So after you have said no to a few things, given up some of the stuff that's holding you back, now you want to point your life in the direction of making a difference for eternity. Where is it you're willing to invest your life for the kingdom of God? You know, I bet it involves choosing something that is already stirring within you. I bet God is already giving you a clue of what that next step is. Something that already lights you up. Something you already think is beautiful or lasting or meaningful. It's not just that we find something that we're, we're able to do. Instead, we, we find something that we feel like we were made to do. And then we do lots of that. If you and I were to sit, to sit down together, uh, face-to-face, knee-to-knee, which is, by the way, a great plug for youth ministry because you, that's what you get to do with students. If you'd like to, to work with, with students, you get to sit down with them shoulder to shoulder, and have these kinds of conversations. But if you and I were to do that, and I asked you to tell me where is it that God is specifically speaking to your heart to invest yourself, what would you say? If we were to have that conversation, maybe some of you would describe a community that that you long for, that you want to be a part of. People studying scripture, sharing their lives with one another. Maybe you find that you're experience rich, but relationship poor. And so you want to invest your time in, in people, and in small group life, Bible study, Sunday school, serving groups, ministry teams. Or maybe for you, your heart goes to reconciliation. Maybe that's something that God is stirring in you. You're especially aware of the brokenness, the strife, the division around you. And you see yourself pouring your time and your energy into bringing people back together, to, to, to bringing peace and healing. Maybe for you, you would tell me that you're ready to engage more fully in worship. Maybe contribute more in music ministry or adding to the beauty and sacredness of our gatherings together. Offering a part of your life that you sense God wants to build on. Possibly you can see yourself in a mentoring role. With growing statistics of the breakdown of families, the absence of fathers in homes, or the lack of enough caring adults in the lives of kids, you may say, I've had enough of this. You want to change the world by simply changing it for one or two kids who have few others who care about them. I want you to know that this morning uh, there are applications on this front pew for Scott County High School's mentoring program. D.T. Wells, who's a member here, D.T. and Becca, he is uh, part of one who is beginning this mentoring program where you can sign up. Uh, It's also on our Facebook page this morning where you can sign up, let them know, and he will connect you with one or two other students that you will meet with weekly to be a mentor. It's really important stuff. Uh, Maybe sitting together, you and I, you maybe look out the window and you'd see someone who was struggling economically, and you'd want to invest your time with the poor. Be present with them, identify with them, understand their struggle better. It might be that you are one who has gone through a deep sorrow and hurt. And maybe, little by little, God is renewing you and and shining hope into your life. And maybe for some of you, you see this as an opportunity to invest your time with those who also are going through difficult times. You might tell me that your heart is to walk alongside those who are bearing the weight of pain and hurt like you have, to share their burden, help guide them, towards some of the healing and the hope that you've experienced. You might share with the desire of some of the families in our church who uh, see opportunity for fostering and adopting. The month of November is uh, adoption month, and maybe like our family, you are seeing signs that are pointing you to a God who has a special place in his heart for the fatherless, and you want to invest your time in helping kids find uh, families. Maybe the Holy Spirit brings to mind your own neighborhood and you know of a single mom down the street or an elderly neighbor across the way and you know somehow that you can help them out. Take the time to love on those folks that God has put right in your path. Uh, and maybe you're one of those who's just really skilled and enjoys just doing stuff for people. Maybe you're a tech geek and you, you know, are really good at that kind of thing. And that's just something that lights you up and you want to use that for other people. 
And even as we prepare for deacon elections this morning, it might be that this reminds you uh, of how God might be drawing you toward greater servant leadership and helping the congregation. You want to help the congregation move closer to the heart of God in whatever capacity that you can. I want you to know that everyone's leap looks different. Everyone's leap looks different. I used to think you had to be special for God to use you, and now I know you simply need to say yes. I want to invite our worship leaders to, to begin kind of making their way up. But for those of you who are setting out on, an, on this journey with God, if you've kind of been thinking, okay, I'm ready to take that next step, I want you to hear the next words that Paul writes here in the book of Philippians. That we're going to continue up, pick, pick up with verse 12. And let this be an encouragement to you. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me brothers and sisters I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it but one thing I do forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus we're going to enter now into a time of invitation and this is the time to respond. It may be that you are responding in your heart and uh, you want to talk with, with someone after the service. You can talk with myself or one of the deacons uh, or, or someone that you would like to share what God is maybe moving you toward next. But as we sing this next song, if you're inviting Jesus into your heart, if you have decisions that you want to share with this church, if you want to join as part of this church family, we would invite you to do so at this time. Jesus is calling you to take the next step with him. Lean forward, step back, or tell God why he's got the wrong person. But we invite you to come. Would you stand? Let us sing.